Hello, time travelers, and welcome to the first of two special Christmas episodes of Biblical Time Machine. I am Dave Roos, one of your hosts. I am here with the amazing, the fabulous, the Christmas-loving Helen Bond, <laughs> professor of Christian <laughs> origins at the University of Edinburgh. Um, Helen, I actually I have a surprise for you. I have a early Ooh. I have an early Christmas gift. <laughs> For you, Ooh, that very I just... exciting, and I do like Christmas, and I like Christmas gifts. Oh, perfect! Um, <laughs> I hope this pays off. It probably won't, uh, <laughs> but I did find out this morning that our podcast has has crossed one hundred thousand downloads. We have had one hundred thousand downloads. That sounds like a That's lot. That's amazing. I wonder how many people have actually listened. Maybe maybe people download it, listen to two seconds. And then I like home. to, I don't even try to pretend <laughs> to know what downloads means. I, in my no, mind, that means no. they listened from beginning to end and they loved yeah. it and they cheered I the whole we'll time. I think we'll go with that. Yeah, I but, think so too. That's great news. Well, hey. Yeah, that's exciting. And, and, and of course, you know, this is a gift, not really from me, to you, this is a gift from our listeners to us. So I want to thank all of our listeners for, for getting us across such a crazy milestone. Thank you so much for listening every week. When I look at the numbers, it's like we have this small and loyal group of people that come back every week, and they do seem to listen to it. So thank you so much. We really hope you're enjoying it, and we hope to keep going. So thank you for your support. All right, but of course, today we are not talking about us. We are talking about... Mary, the mother of Jesus, and we are going to search through the Bible and through what we can figure out from history to to see if we can't get a better picture of of who this woman was, who this woman was before the centuries that have transformed her into, you know, the Mary that that we know today. And we have a great guest. We have James Tabor. Uh, James Tabor, he recently retired as a professor of religious studies at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte, where he taught decades of classes um, on Christian origins and ancient Judaism. And James, he's written a ton of excellent books on the historical Jesus and Paul, but he has a book coming out in 2025 called The Lost Mary, How the Jewish Mother of Jesus Became the Virgin Mother of God. And James has a really great website. This is jamestabor.com, and he posts a ton of really interesting videos that people that listen to the Biblical Time Machine would love, so I encourage you to go check out his website as well. But let's get to our conversation with James Tabor about Mary, the mother of Jesus. Merry Christmas. James Tabor, welcome to Biblical Time Machine. It's great. I, I haven't ever been on a time machine. I've no. fantasized about it, which I think we're going to do at the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope, I hope you've thought about <laughs> really it, because you're only going to get one chance in the time machine, so I, mm -hmm. I hope you've, you've thought of your request. I have thought of it, <laughs> and I've been with Helen in a number of documentaries, right. but unfortunately our paths, like I'm on one day filming, and then I take off, and then she's come in. Yeah, you sort of come and go, don't you? You just hear yeah, James right. Tables yeah. just been or James Tables coming. And um, yeah, we never seem to be there at the same time. We'll try to remedy that sometime. <laughs> I don't think they could have two giants in the field in the same room. I think it would explode. <laughs> um, That's clearly it. <laughs> well, today we are talking about uh, Mary, Mary, mother of Jesus. And I just, well, I just got back. We had a great trip. Um, our daughter is studying abroad in Rome. And so my wife and I got to go and visit her for a week. And, of course, you go to a million museums. And we went up to Florence and went to more museums. And we were joking that it felt like all these painters never read past, like, the first few chapters of, <laughs> of any of the Gospels because it was just Mary, you know, Mary, Joseph, and Jesus, Mary and Jesus, Mary, you know, the Annunciation of Mary, the angel visiting Mary, you know, room after room of these paintings. And they're all, they're beautiful, but it does get a little repetitive. So clearly, you know, a woman who has had her image um, in sculpture and art all over the world, yet, and I was intrigued by this, you know, in your upcoming book, 
she's you know this this most visible most famous woman maybe in the history of of the western world yet you call her the most erased woman in history so what do you mean by that yeah i i i use best known least known hmm. so everybody knows her but nobody knows her and what i mean by that and i would even use the word robbed Huh. Because I think it's a theological overwrite that comes later, and we'll talk about that, I'm sure. But she's robbed of her Jewishness. Uh, who thinks of Mary as a Jewish woman? Mm. She's a nun, basically, or a saint. Even in the images, she's got the habit on and you know looks mm. like a good nun. Mm. Whether she wears nun shoes, I don't know, but, you know... Uh, <laughs> The point is, she's been transformed in in everybody's mind. Um, her womanhood, which I think some people would say, wait, wait, I mean, we all know she's a woman, but she's not a woman who's married with children, uh, a normal sexual life, a family life, all the things we associate with womanhood, especially for a married woman. And other than Jesus, even her children have been robbed from her. Mm. So think about that. If, if we historians are correct, and those four boys and unnamed sisters, we always say at least two, but it could well be that there were three or four girls and five boys. That would be a, a good number. So there might have been nine kids, mm. uh, might have been even more than that, but you know, let's go with seven to nine. So, but even more important than just those things, I think her leadership, hmm. if she's a widowed mother, because as you know, Joseph just kind of disappears. The last story we have of him is Jesus is 12. Hmm. And it seems really odd that he would never be mentioned after that. But is she in charge of a large family of seven to nine kids? What would that involve? Think of it on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. If we could even start with that, a widowed mother, maybe in her 30s or 40s, with seven to nine kids on her hands, how do you make a living? How do you deal with things? And I just think her, her courage, her leadership, her influence, I guess I'm going with the old hand that rocks the cradle kind of thing, <laughs> that I think to say, oh, she was so extraordinary and such a spiritual giant. But did she have nothing to do with the upbringing of this extraordinary family? Mm. So she's been overwritten, erased, rewritten, reshaped to the point that I think she would be shocked. <laughs> I really do. Think of it. I, I'm Jewish. I had these kids. Uh, I loved my husband and he died. Mm. And it was really tough, you know. So how do how would you go on? I mean, I, I think I think you know you, you've you've expressed very clearly there the problem. You know, we have all of the the Catholic tradition, particularly that sees her as the Queen of Heaven and um, you know perpetual Virgin Mother, great you know all all these very very high kind of um, accolade she's got but how then do you go on about finding the historical mary then how do you reconstruct her um you know you say she's been she's bereft of all these things but um what's your approach what's my approach well i wrote these down actually for this interview there are only 10 texts uh, in the whole I'm, New Testament. I'm not going to quote in the entire New Testament. Wow. So it's going to be a challenge. But I'm going to read them really quickly. And those who know the New Testament, and many people where we call these, okay, genealogy of Jesus, that's one. Birth accounts of John the baptizer in Jesus. Jesus at age 12. A wedding at Cana. A scene at Peter's house in Capernaum a scene where Jesus is rejected at Nazareth. And then we go to the crucifixion. Hmm. We just jump mm -hmm. from the birth almost to the end, talking about where she's mentioned. And then maybe the burial and empty tomb, there's a Mary named, and I'm convinced that it is the mother, but she's not identified as the mother. But in John, she is identified as his mother. 
at the cross, and then the day of Pentecost, the traditional date of the founding of the church. Thank God that the author says, oh, also his mother Mary and brothers were there. Mm. So it's like, thank you. You know, she doesn't just completely disappear from the New Testament. Mm. So it's breadcrumbs. It really is. It's breadcrumbs through a dense forest. But I got 10 of them. (laughs) And I do make quite a bit of several of them uh, as we go along. And uh, you've talked about some of your questions you want to ask me. Some of that's going to come up. But it is a kind of dearth of evidence. But it doesn't surprise me on some levels. If you think of the Apostles' Creed, born of a virgin, crucified, died, and buried, rose the third day. Wait, wait, wait. Was there a life there? Mm. (laughs) What happens, I think, is there's a dogma. I think it comes a lot from Paul. Uh, Jesus is born of a woman, and he's crucified, and he's our Savior. You say, well, did he ever teach anything, or what about? And I don't think it's just that Paul doesn't know those things. He doesn't think they're vital for the gospel, the good news. We no longer know Jesus after the flesh, he says. And I think he has a certain aversion to the family. Paul does. And I think as Paul goes, so goes the church. What really counts theologically, that Jesus died for our sins, that he was buried, that he rose the third day, ascended to heaven. So the creeds, as they flow, give her credit for the birth, almost like a vessel, the God-bearer. That's what she's called. She bore Jesus. And we could give her credit for being a pious nun like, you know, woman who might have had some influence. But I'm thinking of a dynamic Jewish woman living in the Galilee in revolutionary times, seeing 2,000 people crucified when Jesus is a year old, probably still nursing, when there was the revolt. Uh, of Judas in the north, and then Simon of Perea. And you had this, I call it the year of the three messiahs, when Herod died, and we think the year 4 BCE. I want to put her there, and uh, and then later with this, this whole group of children that are so influential. But I see her as just at the center of the movement. Well, yeah. So you you tell us you showed us these these few breadcrumbs we have in the text itself. So let's let's hop in the time machine. Let us go back to the first century and try to piece together some of these breadcrumbs into you know a, a larger narrative about what it would have been like to be this Jewish woman living in the Galilee, potentially a widow with these children. And I like to start with the with some of the basics. So. We talked about this a little bit when Helen and I talked about Mary, but like you mentioned, there's lots of Marys in the New Testament. So what what is this name? Like what would have been Mary's uh, name in, in Hebrew or, or Aramaic? And, and where do you think, you know, what's her backstory? Where do you think she grew up? Where, where was she from? Do you have some clues to that? Yeah, we do have a few clues to that. Um, her name in Hebrew would be Miriam, or the, we know it. This is Moses' sister in the Torah. So it is, uh, in the time of Jesus, it's either the first or second most common name. Um, so we, we're we not exactly sure, but it, it's right up there, you know. So maybe 40% of women would be named Mary. <laughs> That's, That's a like, huge amount, isn't it? That's a huge it's amount. 40%. Mary. Yeah. <laughs> But there is a possibility, and here we have to rely more on later church tradition and archaeology, that Mary might have been born in Sepphoris. And so I ha- I'm able to put a whole chapter in the book called Growing Up in Sepphoris. So I kind of build on that little twig that's not even in the New Testament. But my students certainly, and I think most of the public, don't even know what, well, what is that, Sepphoris? Yeah, where's that. where's Sepphoris? Mm-hmm. Yeah, where's Sepphoris? Well, Nazareth is the largest Arab city now, Christian Arab city in, in the Holy Land. But in the time of Jesus, Sepphoris was the urban capital of the Galilee. Uh, population, 
estimated 10 to 20,000. Uh, Herod's palace was there. This is Herod Antipas, the son of Herod the Great. And it was destroyed in 4 BC. It was burnt and destroyed, according to the Jewish historian Josephus. Well, that puts us right in the time of Mary coming back to Nazareth, Herod dying, this revolt breaking out literally three and a half miles north. And if you go to Nazareth, as I've been lots of times, and you walk to the top of any of the hills, you can see the ruins of Sepphoris just to the north. So it'd be like being born for you Brits, uh, Helen, in the suburbs of London. And, you know, name a suburb, you know, and some famous person later comes from that suburb. (laughs) And then you say, uh, well, Helen, what about what about London? And you go, London? Uh, I've never heard of London. What, what What's London? <laughs> this is what we're doing when we say I've never heard of Sepphoris. <laughs> so you got to yeah, just, yeah. that's the yeah. time machine, folks. If we go back, we realize the main roads going north, south, east, west are through Sepphoris. All of a sudden, if Mary's from Sepphoris, and I'll give you the evidence for that in a second, we're talking about trade and commerce and every variety of person coming up from Syria and Damascus and down to Egypt, all kind, and all of a sudden it's not the quaint little village away from anything, not disturbed by anything other than some pious meditation on, you know, the kingdom of God or something, but it's a bustling, busy place. And Sepphoris is being rebuilt at this time by Herod Antipas. Josephus says it was the jewel of all the Galilee. Hmm. And I've excavated there for several seasons. And, you know, we have gotten down to first century levels with my students. And they know all of this because they have a course with me as, as we dig. And they're like, Dr. Tabor. So this street was probably laid in the time of Jesus. I said, absolutely. And we find coins that verify that under the. And all of a sudden we're walking the streets of an urban Roman city laid out very much like a polis you know, or a Greek city. It's got the north-south roads and the crossroads and everything. Herod's palace is there. And then you've got to ask, well, who built that city? And all of a sudden, it is my imagination, but I've got a city and I've got a suburb and I've got a woman with a one-year-old baby and a husband who is a tecton, carpenter translated in the King James, but most of, you know, technology, architect, it means a builder. Uh, Jesus never talked about wood, like I built a door frame or I made a wheel for a wagon. He always talks about stone. Hmm. You know, when you lay a foundation, be careful how you build. Make sure that it's going to be steady. And he uses these examples. So let's just say he's in the building trades. The family's in the building trades. And if they're in the building trades, maybe stone work. Could it be that Joseph, his and his children, the boys, are getting up at 4.30 in the morning. You know, all of a sudden we're imagining a village life as the urban capital is is rising. And Herod Antipas, who later, of course, tries to kill Jesus and does kill John the Baptist. So all of a sudden we can populate, you know, our time machine with quite a few images. But the archaeology is that we do have a Byzantine church. This would be fourth century, built over a house of Mary in Sepphoris. Now, so far, because you know, maybe if it, it's on the it's on the south side actually of Sepphoris, so the south side means it was facing Nazareth. So again, my students always say, "Could it be that?" And the answer is almost always a, "Yeah, maybe it's possible." But I think this approaches more the level of uh, likelihood or even probability that Mary grows up in an urban environment. You begin to get a you know carpenter building, major urban center, crossroads, commerce, and theater. This has been mentioned by Richard Beatty and a number of scholars who might have taken it too far, but Jesus does make theater images. In his teaching, he calls people hupokrites, 
which we just transliterate. We don't translate. We go, oh, that's a hypocrite coming right from the New Testament. But it actually means a, a theater actor, hmm. right? That's what the Greek word means. So there is a theater at Sephiroth. Imagine, I've actually excavated there at the theater. And I look at those seats and I, I you know, did Jesus go to the theater? I have no idea. But it is an affluent Jewish city. It's it's Jewish, by the way. I need to mention that. It's booming. Mm. And yet, uh, you know, maybe Mary's from there. Well, that would add a new dimension to understanding Jesus. Remember how many times he goes to dinner with people? He seems to know, like, what fork to use, we'd say. You know, he's invited to dinner. <laughs> and he, uh, Which he has- he's a, apparently a popular dinner guest. It, it just changes your image that he he can move. Uh, he he speaks to Roman centurions. He can move in with circles of the poor and the needy, as well as some of the wealthy. And quite a few of the wealthy people in the Gospels they they invite him over, right? Uh, uh, and they want to talk to him and so forth. So all of that we can begin to fill in a little bit in terms of her background. All right, so I want I want to get back in our time machine. I want to travel to the Galilee and from your, you know, maybe from your archaeological work and other research, you can kind of help us piece together, you know, now Mary is living probably in Nazareth. She has probably lost her husband, right? We he kind of like you said disappears from the narrative. Um so the the assumption is that maybe he was older and he died. So she's a widow. She's got how many kids? We think maybe seven or nine. Is this a Roman occupied land? Like what what would her life have been like? If Joseph is out of the picture, there's immediately an economic challenge. Hmm. And instead of the lost years of Jesus being, oh, he went and studied with the gymnosophists on the Indus River, or he went down to Egypt and learned the wisdom of the ancients. How about you're now head of the family? Hmm. Then Jesus is going to be in his 20s, and he's taking over things considerably. And then James, his brother, and in that order, Joseph, Simon, Jude, are all participating, perhaps getting up early in the morning, heading out for a long day. The women of the household would be concerned with all kinds of domestic duties, everything from gardening to making your own cloth and weaving and different kinds of domestic chores. Uh, Like any kind of a family of this size without a dominant breadwinner, as we would think Joseph might be, there's a tremendous amount of work. Everybody's got to pitch in. And the older kids help with the younger kids. So all of a sudden, and Instead of just picturing Jesus as the kind of Lone Ranger figure, as we all do, walking up and down the hills with 12 people, you've got this bustling family that's full of all kinds of activity. And now I get to imagine Mary as the matriarch of that clan, teaching. And I want Mary to be a teacher. Now, look, Mary could have been as dumb as a stone, as they say. You know, like, she didn't teach Jesus anything. In fact, she was like, don't go out and do all that stuff. You're not the Messiah. You're crazy. Hmm. And that's one view that we've seen in some novels and books that have been quite popular. But another image would be a woman who, you know, takes full responsibility and has this amazing influence on these boys and begins to teach them. Maybe she's the one who taught them You know, if somebody makes fun of you in the village, doesn't like your name or pushes you down or whatever, just turn the other cheek. Don't don't even reply to them. You're actually going to get further with them if you'll rise above it. What if Mm. what if she, you know, noticing all of those crucifixions that she had personally witnessed the carnage. And if she is a pious Jewish woman who believes in the kingdom of God. It was quite common at that time to think that the time was at hand. Where did Jesus get that idea? Is it just the lonely Jesus walking off on a hillside, getting everything? Mm -hmm. Or is it the bustling household in which Mary is also saying, 
you know, we want the kingdom of God, but we don't want it violently. Hmm. And uh, we, we have a different approach to the kingdom of God, which is allow the will of God to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hmm. You know, something more simple, but potentially more revolutionary. So Mary has this huge influence on Jesus then. And I think, I think, you know, that seems to make a lot of sense. But what about once Jesus starts on his own ministry? Um, what's her place in the movement then? Is she still in Nazareth? Or, and, and, you know, what do you make of those, those sort of awkward passages in Mark where she seems to be not understanding the movement? Sort of what's happening there? Yeah, what you have, actually, it's not as much as one would think. Let me give you an alternative. The one you're talking about, I think, is primarily uh, maybe Mark Mark 3. Mark 3, yeah, where they go, she and Uh, and the brothers and sisters go to get him and bring him home. Exactly. So it it does say that that his, his kin began to get him and pull him away because people were saying he's crazy. But the next, it doesn't actually say his mother, but the next story is the house. And the house is so crowded, you can't even eat. Now imagine that. I mean, we've all been to big suppers and private events in homes where it's quite crowded, but you can't even get in. And the mother and brothers show up and they live there. Mother, brother, and sisters, they all show up. They've been out shopping or whatever they're doing. Maybe they're shopping for the group. And uh, somebody says, your mother and brothers are outside. And this is always taken negatively. And uh, John Painter, you know, who wrote the book, Just James, he suggested something that has stuck with me, and I consider it in the book, that it could very well be a me casa su casa thing. You know, somebody says, your mother and brothers are outside. And what you could see the alternative of saying to, oh, the group, yeah, the family's here now. Sorry, you guys, we're going to have to break up. And he goes, you're all my family. Everybody's my family. Yes, they're here. They're my family, but you're my family too. If you hear and do the word of God, we're all one family. I could see that as a positive thing, not a rejection thing. And the other one is the wedding at Cana, which is John. And it does sound in English, at least, like he's talking rather rudely to Mary who says, uh, we're out of wine, what do we do? And she seems to have some charge of the wedding. Some people have suggested it's Jesus' wedding. Mm -hmm. I doubt that. Others have suggested maybe it's James. It is in Cana, which is very near Nazareth. It's actually north of Sepphoris, a little town that's been excavated now. And so uh, he says something like, uh, what's that to me? And then, you know, go do this or go do that. I don't know that we're getting an accurate account of what was said at that wedding, first of all, because it's getting filtered through John's theology and John's whole presentation, maybe of the family, which is not entirely positive. But um, I'm not sure that that's actually, if, if it is a wedding, you know, it's a miracle story about making wine, basically. So uh, I just don't give it a a lot of weight. Uh, As far as the brothers being maybe jealous of Jesus or not going along with him at first, I think that could be very likely because siblings do that. Like, well, he thinks he's the chosen one and we all have that lineage or something like that. But I don't think there's as much negative as you think. And, and, you know, I mean, people always name the Mark three thing Mm -hmm. and they name the wedding And then you go, yeah, well, what else? Well, she's at the cross, and all the men have run away. That's pretty courageous. And probably at the tomb for the anointing with Mary Magdalene and the other and the sister. So she sounds to me like she's uh, sticking with them. I would think, Helen, that when they're traveling around the Galilee, she has to keep the home fires burning when they all go down to Jerusalem for these festivals three times a year, everybody's together. And it takes three nights to get there. Josephus tells us the route from the Galilee. You camp out three different nights. Last night is Jericho. Then you go up to Jerusalem. You're going to be setting up camp. You're going to be cooking. You picture little kids running around and pets maybe (laughs) and so (laughs) forth. 
uh, you know, it's an, it's, it's a caravan mm -hmm. all going down. Uh, and again, I think that would be very positive. You know, they're all going down for the festival. And then she knows the family of John the baptizer. And as Jesus is growing up, if Mary and Elizabeth, that's John's mother in the Gospel of Luke, are their relatives some way, usually we say, you know, is it like cousins or something like that? Because it's not specified. But it does seem to be a blood relationship of some type. Uh, I'm picturing those boys growing up together. They're born six months apart, according to our records. So again, um, what would Jesus be like at age 10 in Jerusalem for Passover with John the Baptist running around too? And maybe the family's getting together. And where would they stay when they went down to Judea? Maybe at, uh, we don't, we, we call it Ein Kerem today. That's the traditional town where John the Baptist grew up. So, you know, there's just a lot we could possibly fill in. But I don't, I don't really see the, the negative side of it. Uh, I, I don't think it's very strong. Uh, and I think particularly the Mark 3 passage can be pretty positive. Mm -hmm. I picture Mary walking in and going, yes, of course, you're all my family. You guys don't have to leave. We can squeeze you in. <laughs> we just got some more food from the market. There's plenty for everybody. Yeah. So it's just another flipping of the coin to look at it a different yeah. way. And I think some of that playing down of Mary, I mean, she's so exalted in the church as the vessel who brought Jesus, but then the non-sexual woman who doesn't, I mean, she's married, but he's off the scene and who, who lives a celibate ascetic life as a perpetual virgin. Uh, I think some of that's playing in as well as the idea that anything really major and great, as I said earlier, has to come right from God to Jesus rather than coming up more naturally through the family. I mean, families are so important for everybody, every one of us. We're so influenced by our family for good or ill or somewhere in between. Yeah, no, it's so, it's so, I don't know. It's so easy to forget that the experiences that we have today as humans, they're, they're not radically different than the experiences that they were having 2000 years ago. I would like to think that if I became an itinerant preacher, that my mom would walk around with me and she would she would hang out and that she would uh continue to uh <laughs> support me. She's 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 very supportive of even, including of this podcast. She listens to every episode of the podcast well, even though What, what about the understands. logistics uh Dave, what about the logistics <laughs> even of uh sending out 70? Think of the organization of that. Hmm. We're going to send out 70. They seem to leave from Capernaum, that's where he is then. So you got 70 people are going to go out two by two. This is in Luke chapter 10. And they're going to kind of follow the Essene example that we see in the scrolls, you know, of don't carry a lot. And wherever you go, you'll meet other communities that will support you. But that has to be organized by somebody. And again, we're picturing Jesus. All he does is like walk on hills and down valleys and sit on rocks <laughs> and teach people. Imagine the logistics like, OK, now I want you two are going here and you two are going there. I see her as involved in that. So I'm picturing there are probably 100 or so people, uh, certainly lots of women. We constantly read in the Gospels and the women who followed mm -hmm. him from Galilee. Well, there's a lot when you say the women who followed him from Galilee, that is a huge mouthful. You know, how many women? And are they some of the wives or sisters or children of the apostles? And the apostles we tend to think of as not married, but Paul talks about the apostles being married and taking their wives with them when they travel, right? And so, yeah, we can just populate our imaginations and our time machine with a lot of things that they're speculative, but they're not far-fetched given yeah. what you just said, that so there's just a lot going on that the movies almost never bring out. How many times have you seen a Jesus movie? Jesus and 12 guys walking up and down mm -hmm. hills and valleys 
earth and sitting on rocks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's the image of Jesus. In There's the never those women from Galilee. The women right there <laughs> and, and the hustle and the bustle mm -hmm. and the dishwashing and the campfires yeah. and the cooking and the cleanup. And, and I'm going to say the dogs and people said, oh, they didn't have dogs. Well, are you sure? We have a great dog story in the Gospel of Mark <laughs> in which household dogs are below the table mm. catching scraps from the meal. That can sound very familiar to some of us who have pets. Yeah, and, uh, we're both dog lovers, of, aren't we? <laughs> this was part of the culture. And so did what, do you, what did they have kennels where you leave your dogs when the whole village goes <laughs> down? You realize the whole Jewish village is going down. The dogs went too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So now, see, I always, I always have movie ideas when we have these episodes. So great. I'm we gonna write. I'm gonna write a movie called Jesus's Dog, and it's gonna be from the perspective of the dog <laughs> as he's following <laughs> this very, you know, bustling caravan of people. I, I'm already, I already have David, the first uh, I'm scene. I'm telling you, that is brilliant. That I got it. Brilliant. People love dogs. People love Jesus. It's gonna sell. Um, <laughs> I'm taking you seriously, man. I think that would be look, fabulous. Uh, all right. And well, the look. kids would just flock to that movie <laughs> because the dog is the dog would talk, right? Like mm. in its own um, dog room. Yeah. No, we're we're still figuring that out. We're still casting some people for that. But yeah, maybe maybe the dog will talk. Um, <laughs> but I do want to. I want to get to. Uh, I want to get to the Pentecost scene that you referred to earlier because, like you said. The, the author goes out of his way, or her way, to mention that Mary was among them in this upper room uh, at this very important moment in, in the, the history of, of Christianity. So what does that signal to you, that, she, that they went out of their way to mention that she was there? Does she remain an active member of this movement even after Jesus' death? I think for sure. And first of all, she's there, and the brothers are there. And one of the brothers, when Jesus dies, James, the oldest, takes charge of the movement. And I would be so bold as to say he's the disciple that Jesus loved mm. because he turns over the care of his mother to this one. And I know right. everybody says it's John, the son of Zebedee, who's actually known for some pretty hot-headed scenes once he wants to burn a village because they didn't listen. And later, another time, he wants to get one of the chief seats. You know, could I, my brother and I sit on the right and left hand? They're called the Sons of Thunder. Uh, okay. Nothing against those Zebedee boys, but um, Stephen Shoemaker has done a lot of research on Mary. He's probably the world's expert on Mary, particularly the history of Mary in the early, early Christianity. And he, he presents some really strong evidence that Mary died in Jerusalem on Mount Zion, what's, what it's called today. And there is there now, of course, it's a modern building, the Dormition Abbey, mm. but it's built right next to that upper room site. Mm. But that little uh, Church of the Apostles, as it was later called, that little building, uh, does survive because when they built the basilicas of Mary later in the Byzantine period and then rebuilt in the Crusader period, that they preserve that as, what, uh, first of all, outside the building, just they built the church next to what's the structure of the upper room. And in the Crusader period, it was actually inside the church, the Church of St. Mary. So she's just associated with Mount Zion from birth to death. Hmm. And we have texts on the assumption of Mary and the dormition of Mary, as it's called, when Mary fell asleep, in other words. Hmm. So um, I think we can put her there. And if you and lots of traditions, I, I cover them in the book and, and a little bit of archaeology. We're not going to find, you know, Mary was here or something like that. <laughs> but there is a first century floor in that building. It does have some Christian graffiti written and associated with that first level of the floor. So it's being remembered as the place where James presided. Uh, uh, we have this in the book of Acts, chapter 15, where the apostles meet. 
and James is in charge suddenly. He's not even introduced as who he is, but he gets up and says, uh, uh, my decision is that we do this and that, and everybody's like, oh, okay. But Paul's letters really help us because he says, I went up to Jerusalem and I saw James, the brother of Jesus. And, uh, and he sees him again later and has a dialogue with him. I'm assuming Mary's right there, hmm. uh, depending on the date. But that's pretty early. That's, that's around 50. So uh, she could still be there, still be alive very easily. So again, I'm imagining, you have to imagine, but I'm trying to imagine in, in the direction of what I think might be the truth uh, based upon just a whole web of evidence that uh, would put her there. I don't see any evidence of her traveling in Asia Minor in all of those later traditions. And if you look at the dates of those traditions, they're, they're quite late. Mm-hmm. I do also cover that in the book. I, I do consider those ideas because they're pretty popular today. People go and see Mary's house, you know, in Turkey and so Mm. forth. So, yeah, she's the, I see her as the matriarch of the movement. Uh, The boys uh, are taking over. It it is, the early Christians talk about the despasunai, which means the family of the Lord. And they're apparently a group of uh, brothers and cousins and sisters and maybe second cousins, but they're all, they all have a kind of relationship to the family of Jesus. And we can trace them into the second and third century. They end up in Transjordan, and we have some literature from them. But James is probably the key. Uh, I don't know that the final author of John, you know, it, it, I think it has several levels. Most scholars uh, agree with this, uh, thinks that the beloved disciple is James, but I think there's a tradition about a disciple whom Jesus loved taking over the care as the next brother in line. It's a very Jewish thing to do. When the Mm. older brother dies, you pass on your mother. And to me, the anomaly would be, if, if that's not the case, that we give Mary to John, the son of Zebedee, who's really not known for his loving kindness and his grasp of the spiritual dimensions of the kingdom. So the anomaly would be that that James is there and he's going to take charge of the movement. And we have really good sources on that. I think it's pretty well accepted. It's not Peter, it's James. And when Paul names the pillars of the church, it's James, Peter, and John in that order. Hmm. And James is in charge. And you check things with James, but then he doesn't take care of his own mother. You know, he's not in charge. It just doesn't make sense. Seems, I, yeah, I can't imagine a Jewish cult. I know, you know, I, I'm not Jewish, but I'm very connected in Israel to Jewish families and homes and so forth. And believe me, if the mother is left alone, the brothers step up and the older brother takes charge. So uh, I don't put the story in the wider context of the Gospel of John, where the family, if anything, is played down. So, James, we do really have a time machine, and we're putting (laughs) it at your disposal, so you can go anywhere you like. like Do something like this. <laughs> no, 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 you my no. We we handle out. the controls. We have, yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't well, worry, don't worry. Okay. It's quite technical, so uh, you know we well, are fully trained. Dave gave me a hit that you would ask me this, so I've really, really struggled. So where and when do you want to go? Okay, here it is. Fall of twenty six CE in the Galilee, <laughs> in Nazareth. But I said fall. So it's about the time when Jesus is leaving Nazareth and he says, I'm going down. My cousin John has started this movement. I'm going to go join the movement and be baptized of John. Hmm. And I'm going to officially take up the cause. And I want to hear the discussion in the home in Nazareth (laughs) as he begins to discuss this. So I'll get to see Mary and James and the brothers and the sisters, yeah. I'll get to see what Mary said. Like, that's a fabulous idea. I think we should all join you. Hmm. But you go ahead and prepare the way. And then I get to see John because I want to, I get to, you got to give me a little time, like a week. <laughs> yeah, you can stay as long as you want. John, 
And all of a sudden, he's not this crazy, wild-haired guy screaming at the top of his lungs like somebody that was just released from a mental <laughs> mental care or something like that. But he's actually someone who says, you know, if any of you have two coats, share with them who has one. If you have some food, share with others. Mm. He's teaching Jesus stuff. But he is teaching repentance. Everybody thinks John is so rigid because he's a Nazarite. Mm. Well, Paul is later a Nazarite too. And he's seen as fairly you know, open in terms of interpreting the Torah. So I think our movie version of John is wrong. And I want to go in the time machine and prove that. Mm. I think he's a lovely man. I think Jesus <laughs> deeply loved him. I think they were close. And then they split. And Jesus takes the south, and John stays in the north baptizing. They're a joint baptizing campaign. Hmm. And that goes through the fall. So i gotta, I got to have a month or two. Oh, it that. was a week before. Now it's a month or two. No, well, the hard, I mean, the, the hard part is getting there. You can stay as long as you want. It's, <laughs> well, you got to get really back. The hard part. Yeah, <laughs> Presumably we'll work, you want we'll to We'll work back. the schedule. Well, the day he leaves... I, I could make it in a week. The day he leaves the house, he tells them the day before, and we get to see that. <laughs> and then uh, we get to go down and see what John looks like. That sounds well, that's good. That's awesome. Well, that's, that, is a, that is a beautiful scene. I love the way, again, you, you picture the, the family having this discussion. And I think that's a big takeaway for, for me from this discussion is, of course, of course, this was a family affair. And, and as a widowed mother of these children, Mary would have been at the center of this family affair. So thank you so much, James. Uh, thank you, and Helen. David, please yeah. remember the dog, the family dogs. <laughs> I know. They had, they had three dogs. They're all there, too. Okay. <laughs> Very important. I'm not a dog person, but I will take an exception for this uh, for this scene. Thank you. Thank you, James. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, listeners. Um, happy holidays. A Merry Christmas to, to everyone. And we will see you all on the next episode of Biblical Time Machine. Bye. Bye. Happy Christmas. If you enjoyed this episode of Biblical Time Machine, consider supporting us by subscribing to our Time Travelers Club. Find out more in the episode description below.